Good morning, everyone. Welcome to everyone here and those joining us on YouTube. We're so glad that you're all with us today. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, you are so awesome, holy, perfect, pure, and other in every way. Father, you are worthy of extravagant worship. We come before you this morning. We offer to you all that we are, all that we have. Father, we thank you for your great care in our lives. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the gift and treasure that it is. And as we open up your word, we pray that you would take us to a place where we can receive from you. Open up our eyes, open up our ears and our hearts. Father, we pray that you would take this message and make it edifying, beneficial, and useful to the body. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I remember a year ago when we entered 2020, it seemed like everyone had a lot of great energy and enthusiasm to welcome in the new year. I even heard people say, it's 2020. This could be a year of vision, 2020. You know, a year of opportunity. You know, there was a lot of excitement. We all had no idea what we were in for, no idea that the year would be like it was. COVID-19, the racial riots, hurricanes, and the election were major valleys that we're still walking in as we entered this new year. So needless to say, I've seen a really big difference in how people welcomed in 2021. For many, there's uncertainty and a wonder if things will ever get better for others, there's despair over our political climate. And certainly, there's a lot of concern over the continuing effects of COVID-19 and how that disease is continuing to affect everyone. Uncertainty, despair, concern. And much like last year, we have no idea what this year will look like. But for us as Christians, we do have something that we know will happen this year. We have something that we know with absolute certainty will happen throughout every day of this year. And it'll happen regardless of what takes place in our country or in our world. It's in Psalm 23, 6, where it says, quote, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. See, what this verse is saying is that we are pursued every day, throughout the day, by God's goodness and his mercy. So no matter what is happening this year, I will only get two things, all day and all night, and that's goodness and mercy. Now to unpack this further, we want to look at this verse in its context. This is part of the 23rd Psalm, which is known as the Shepherd Psalm. David wrote it, and David is a master shepherd. And through his work as a shepherd, he sees incredible parallels between how he cares for his sheep and how the Lord cares for his people. So David actually begins the Psalm with a boast. He's boasting in the fact that the Lord is his shepherd. When he says in verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's saying, with the Lord as my shepherd, I don't want anything else. I have the Lord as my shepherd. With a shepherd as awesome as mine, I don't desire anything. See, David knew that through his own experience, that the welfare of the sheep depends on the diligence, the effort, the skill, the attention, the focus, and the heart that's put into the labor. So he also knows the credentials of the Lord. 
And so knowing the credentials of the Lord, he is exceedingly glad to come under the care of such an awesome shepherd. David wrote in Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now David didn't know exactly how many stars were out there, but he had a great idea of how vast the universe is. There's over 250 million times 250 million stars in our universe. And each one is there simply because God spoke. Each one was named and given a specific location in which to shine. At the same time, if you go outside and you pick up a teaspoon of soil, a teaspoon of dirt and hold it in your hand, you're holding over 500, 500,000 microorganisms in that little teaspoon of dirt. 500,000 microorganisms. And God created and he knows each one. See, everything that we can see and even things we don't see, from the stars to the soil, exists simply because God spoke. All the colors, the variety, the beauty, the grandeur is all from God. David saw this and he was overwhelmed with God. In addition, David as a believer had a keen knowledge that the Lord chose to create him as an object of his delight and affection. Psalm 139 verses 13 through 16 says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So David knew that even the detail that God put into creating him, his eye color, his hair color, all of his physical makeup is God's design for God's great purposes. You know, there's a great example of this in the story of a missionary named Amy Carmichael. She was born in Northern Ireland where many people there had blonde hair and blue eyes. But when God fashioned her, he gave her brown hair and brown eyes. You know, she really struggled with that as she grew up. She even prayed fervently for God to change her eye color. Change my eyes to brown. I don't want these, or to blue. I don't want these brown eyes. And she was so crushed and disappointed that it didn't happen. It's something that she struggled with as she grew up. But when she turned 20, she sensed that the Lord was calling her to be a missionary. And she ended up going to India, where she had tremendous impact. She founded an orphanage, a school, and a safe house for young girls. Countless girls were saved from prostitution and sex trafficking. And they were saved by the gospel. See, she eventually went on to learn that her unwanted brown eyes were a precious gift from God because they enabled her to easily fit into the culture of India. God had wisely fashioned her with brown hair and brown eyes so that she could be like the thousands of girls that she would eventually rescue. You see, there's no mistakes with God. He knows and is in every single detail, and he knows what he's doing. Now, in addition to this, even though each of us are fearfully and wonderfully made, we are all born like sheep who have gone astray. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. You see, we're born in sin. And because of that, we're under the judgment and the wrath of God. Because God is a just God. And our rebellion cries out for justice. 
Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3 says, We all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You see, we're born with a natural desire to please ourselves. And we have no desire for God or the things of God. So we're separated from God because of our sin. And that makes us objects of wrath, objects of justice. We'll thank God that he had the deep desire to make a way for us to come underneath his care and his shepherding. John chapter 10 verses 14 and 15 says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep. Jesus made a way for us to come under his care by coming to die on the cross. When he went to the cross, he took all of the wrath and the justice that each of us deserved from the Father. That's how much he desired that we come to him. Now he calls his sheep by name, and he makes us his own special people through faith. And he delights in his labor for us. John chapter 15, verse 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. This is amazing. Not only did he make it possible for us to come under God's care, but he sought us out. He specifically pursued and chose us to be underneath his care. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's because God chose you. He decided to fix his mercy and not as justice upon you. And the fruit that he's talking about here are things that no one could ever earn or buy. Could never earn it or buy it. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Have you ever been in a position where maybe it was in gym class or when you were young and, and playing, playing games with your friends and p- the kids were choosing teams? You know, everyone's excited, you know, when they're picked. You know, everyone's excited that they were picked to be on a certain team. But then you get to that last person and they realize that they weren't really picked. You know, they made a team by default. You know, they were the last person and their team was the next one to receive someone. It's not really exciting, to say the least. But to realize this, that out of everyone that was ever created, God decided to choose you to be on his team. He picked me. Out of all the people, he picked me. And it wasn't because we ever deserved it or we earned it. It's simply because God wanted to. You know, his mercy is not based on anything that we do. There'd be way too much pressure if it was. You know, for example, if you think, well, God shows you because you have a great speaking ability. He could use that. Well, what would happen one day if you messed up your gospel presentation? You'd wonder, does God still love me? I messed that one up. Does God still love me? Or what if you you felt, well, God chose me because I'm really good at loving other people. But what if you got angry at somebody or treated somebody in an unkind, unloving way? Well, you'd be left with the thought, well, does God still love me now? You see, there's nothing about our performance that we can do to earn God's mercy. It's there because he chose to give it to us. What a privileged position to be in. What an honor. The king of the universe chose to fix his mercy on us, not because of anything we are or anything we did. And by faith, we're under the care, the love, the guidance, the protection, 
the provision of an almighty, infinitely loving and good God. Psalm 34.10 goes on to say, But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Jeremiah 32, 40 through 41 says, And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good. See, God is excited to do good to us. In Romans 8, 28, God promises, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. This is an amazing promise because, you know, that includes our sin, our trials, our difficulties, our temptations, our mess-ups, and our challenges. All things are going to work for our good. They will be used to bring good into our lives. And only God can do it. Only God can do this. So even though David lived before Christ's time, he still knew God's infinite ability, his infinite skill, infinite love and heart. And that's why he's boasting here. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want With God as my shepherd, what else do I need? I have everything because I have him. He's saying that he's under the best care in the universe, and he couldn't ask for anything more. I I can't ask for anything more than this. That's why David can confidently proclaim, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. As Paul wrote in Romans 5.10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You see, if God's goodness and mercy pursued us when we were enemies, how much more now that we are his children? Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue God's people all the days of their lives. Well, you know, these words are very easy to believe and proclaim when things are going well. But honestly, it almost seems like a mockery when trial hits. You know, when we're hurt by circumstances or we hear the bad news or when we're hurt by a people and things we go through. Sometimes we go to a point where we actually doubt God's love and goodness. Goodness and mercy seem so far away and certainly don't seem to be pursuing us. Well, about 17 years ago, Vanessa and I moved into a house that was clearly a fixer-upper. And I started with the room downstairs because the floor was actually saturated with animal urine. And the smell was really bothering Vanessa, especially since she was pregnant with Chloe. Well, I immediately began ripping out the floor. And then I had to rip out the walls. Well, one day, there was an electric line going from a box in the basement. That electric line was going all along the wall and then went into the ceiling and then up behind the kitchen wall into our kitchen. And you know, it wasn't behind the wall like most electric lines. It was actually diagonally stapled on the paneling right along the wall. So I had a couple hours in between work and a Bible study that I was leading. So I wanted to remove the electric wire so that I could work on the wall behind it. So I had a couple hours, and I thought, I'll just take, take off this, this electric line. Now, I know so much more about electric now. All right, so I would not do this if I knew then what I know now. Um, but this is what I did. So I, I took a screwdriver and tried to pry up the staples, you know, as I'm going just to get the, the electric off the wall. And of course, the screwdriver slipped and went into the wire, and a huge flash of light, it was, it was incredible, huge flash of light and a big black stain on the wall. 
Well, needless to say, I lost all power to our kitchen. Our refrigerator, our stove, everything was down. And I had Bible study in less than three hours and work the next day. What should I do? What were we going to do with all the food? Ah, oh, I was so upset. I remember taking the screwdriver and I threw it to the ground and I said, yeah, all things work together for my good, right? Right? I would love to see how this is going to bring good into my life. I can't possibly see how this is good for me. Oh, I was so angry and upset. So then I started praying, but it was totally out of anger. I was like, God, how? How is this going to be good? Well, immediately as I was praying, a friend came to my heart. And it was actually a friend that said, hey, Steve, I know you're a new homeowner. If you ever need help with electricity, give me a call. So obviously, uh, you know, I gave him a, a call. And he's a school teacher. So he just so happened to be passing through Port Jervis when I, when I called. And he just so happened to have his tools in his truck with him. Now, I explained you know, what happened. And, and it was about five minutes be before the store down the street was going to close. So he immediately went to the store, got there just in time to buy all new wire. Now, when he removed the old wire, he showed me that the part of the wire that was in the ceiling that no one could see and was in, behind the wall was totally exposed. Mice had eaten away all the vinyl. All the wire was totally exposed. He said this would have definitely been a fire. So he installed the new wire, and everything was up and running before Bible study. Now, I was so alarmed to know that our house could have burned if that wire wasn't totally removed. I learned a very valuable lesson that day. You know, God sees things that we can't see. And everything that does happen truly does work out for the good. Now, I was fortunate to get an immediate response from God to see the goodness in it. But not all circumstances work out that way. But what I do know from that circumstance is that God can clearly see things that I can't. And he knows what he's doing, even when it seems contrary to what we think should happen. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not, and your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And you know, we experience the truth of this verse on so many levels. Leadership, for example. We lead not by being first, but by serving. We receive blessing not by receiving things, but by giving things. And we discover real life by losing what we think is most important, not holding on to what we think is most important. See, the ways of God are, are often opposite of what we normally think. And you know, there's a reason for that. A.W. Tozer wrote that God is not limited to time. He sees all of the past, present, and future in one view. So right now, he sees us worshiping right here and he's watching Noah build the ark. He's watching uh, Samson kill off some Philistines. He's watching Moses lead Israel. And at the same time, he's watching all the events of 2021. And at the same time, he sees us glorified with him in heaven. He's seeing all of this in one view. So he knows what is truly good and merciful to us. And he has the power to be able to promise that to us in all the days of our lives. God sees our yesterdays. And he sees that they have an impact on our todays and our future. For example, Pastor Tim Keller shared a story of a man who was driving down a dark road. And he accidentally hit a pedestrian 
and he killed, killed the man. Well, the driver was scared, so he just drove off. Well, he eventually found, he was eventually found, and he was sentenced to prison for leaving the scene of an accident and for killing the guy. Now, in a statement that the driver made, he said, this problem started because I, I broke my dad's watch. It was a very confusing statement at first, but he went on to explain. He said, you know, when I was a kid, my dad had a very expensive watch. And when he wasn't looking, I went to play with it, and I broke it. So what he did was he, instead of confessing it to his dad, he fixed it so that it, it appeared to not be broken. So that when the dad went for the watch, you know, it would either be that maybe the dad broke it or, or the watch was just broken. Well, he learned at an early age to cover up his mistakes. Because he got away with it, deeper and deeper levels, bigger and bigger issues as he was growing up. And he just kept covering his mistakes, covering his mistakes. So when he hit the pedestrian, he thought he could just drive off without anybody knowing to cover it up. Well, he was finally caught. You know, there's sinful and harmful behavior in us that's deeply ingrained into our nature, into our character. And God wants to set us free more and more and to make us into the best version of us possible. You know, each of us chosen has an opportunity and the ability to reflect the beauty and glory of Jesus Christ in a unique way. And you know, no one will ever reflect Jesus like you. No one can do it like you can. There never was, and there'll never be a person who can reflect the glory of Jesus Christ like you can. So there are sinful things, this behavior in us, that keep us from doing that. And often, God will use difficulty and pain to have these things exposed and removed. You know, in a small way, it's like a, a child that comes to a parent with a splinter in his finger. You know, no, no parent is just going to cover that with a Band-Aid. But we all know the pain when things like that have to be removed. But the removal is necessary for that finger to be healthy and to avoid a more serious infection. So the Lord sees our past and often wants to protect us and make us into a better version of ourselves. And he knows in his goodness and mercy how to set us free to do that. Our shepherd also sees our present, and he gives us his best in it. Second, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is talking about a thorn in the flesh. Now, it's not exactly mentioned what it was, but we just know it's a quote-unquote messenger of Satan. It's something that brought a lot of pain to Paul, but he describes the effect of it in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 through 10. He says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So what Paul is saying here is that our present challenges, the difficulties, the hard things we go through are a mercy and a goodness because they're a doorway to getting more of God. More of God's power, more of God's wisdom, comfort, peace, and strength. You see, out of all things, God is the epitome of goodness. There is nothing greater than God. Nothing in this world compares to him. What Paul is saying here is that the thorns in our flesh will cause us to depend on God more, and we'll get that all-sufficient grace in our adversity to a point where Paul is actually boasting and taking pleasure in his infirmities. Paul was happy to see adversity because he knew something greater was going to happen to him. 
he would be given more of God, more of the epitome of goodness. You know, Job had a similar story. Job lost his children, his business, his health, his possessions. And we see God did not answer Job's question of why. You know, Job asked, why is this happening? God doesn't answer that question. But what God did was he overwhelmed Job with himself, with with who he is. He gave Job himself, and Job was more than satisfied. See, in our present adversity, we will be pursued by goodness and mercy because we'll get more of God in it. God also sees our future. In Romans 8, 18, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, Pastor Tom has taught that this describes a very powerful future event. And that future event is called the apocalypsis. Now, the apocalypsis is the revealing. The revealing. Now, this is like a master artist comes to an art show with his, his best and finest work. It sits in a room covered. Everyone at that show is just dying to see this work because they know how awesome the artist is and they know this is his, his best work. So everyone sits at the edge of their seat for this revealing of art. This describes the apocalypse. The universe is seated with great desire and a yearning, wanting to see this revealing because they know how awesome God is and they know that this is his best work. And you know, this revealing is us. We are God's finest. Out of all things he created in the entire universe, we are his finest work. We're being prepared for the apocalypse, for that revealing. You and me in our glorified state, God's greatest work of art. 2 Corinthians 4.17 kind of describes how this works out. And it says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now you know for Paul, light affliction meant being shipwrecked three times being pursued by people who wanted to kill him, being beaten until almost dead, being hungry and cold, and then facing the dangers of wild animals as he traveled. Those were his light afflictions. He said that they're working for an eternal weight of glory for us in eternity. Now, Randy Alcorn uh, explains how this works. In the resurrection, we all get new bodies. The same substance that currently makes up our bodies now will be all reconstructed to make our glorified body. And it'll be perfect in every way. It'll never know the sin, the sickness, or decay, or the aches and pains when you get up in the morning. We'll never know any of that. Now this new body will be able to contain the glory of God. It'll be full of the glory of God. Now each of us, as we, we will be full, but our sufferings and our pain on this earth will determine the weight of that glory. Paul says, for the afflictions, they work for us a greater weight of glory. So as each of us will be filled, some vessels will somehow be enabled to bear the greater weight, will bear the greater weight. And that weight that we bear is specifically related to the amount of pain, suffering, and trial that we go through now. And this glory that we receive from our sufferings and pain will be forever. It'll never diminish. It'll never go away. And our pain that we go through won't even be able to compare with it. That's the glory that we'll have in the revealing, in the apocalypse. And Paul is saying that our suffering will result 
in our greater good. We will be better off eternally because of the temporary pain and the trade-off is an awesome deal. And so sometimes goodness and mercy come in the form of short-term pain for long-term gain. Randy Alcorn, in his book, If God is Good, says, quote, God is doing what it takes to create the greatest amount of ultimate good, even when, for now, that requires evil and suffering. If he knows that a limited amount of evil, lasting a limited amount of time, can result in far more eternal good, then wouldn't he be morally justified in allowing it? The God is promising that even our pain and our suffering will bring incalculable future goodness. You know, as I started my senior year in college, I was so excited. You know, that feeling being a senior, you're on top of the world, and, and you're ready for this year. I finally got the classes I wanted, the schedule I wanted. I was going to be a professor's assistant. I was going to be involved in student government. This was going to be the best semester ever. And then I came down with mono. And I had to leave after only being there for three days. So I, I was only three days there. Everything I was looking forward to was gone. I was so disappointed. Oh, I was so depressed. But time would tell that this was God's goodness and mercy. You know, during my time off, I had an opportunity to apply for and, and actually find and apply for an internship in the New York State Assembly. So I had a chance to work with an assemblyman from Saratoga Springs. That was the best semester ever. Now, I also met people who had a significant impact on my future and calling. And all of that would have been missed had I been in Binghamton that semester. Not to mention what God protected me from. At the end of the semester, I got a phone bill. Well, you see, this was back in the day when we had landlines. And even though I wasn't there that semester, I was the first person in the room when we arrived on the campus. And so I had put the phone in my name. But I didn't make any calls. So I, had, I tried to call my roommate to see if he would pay for his calls. Yeah, and it was some strange voice, you know, that on the voicemail. So I didn't leave a message, and I, I ended up calling my sweet mate. And he said, uh, you didn't hear what happened? And he went on to say that my roommate, he was a very, very intelligent kid. He was able to use his computer to break into other students' bank accounts. And he was able to wire money out of their account into his bank account. He stole over $10,000 from Binghamton students. Now, when the police arrested him and they searched the room, they found a shotgun in his closet and potassium cyanide in his desk drawer. So that was my roommate. Um, so <laughs> as, I, as I said to my sweet mate, I said, uh, yeah, never, I'll, I'll take care of the bill. <laughs> yeah, never mind, I'll, I'll pay that one. Um, so we see how our short-term pain lead, can lead to so much more gain. John Piper wrote that in times of difficulty, both the suffering and the grace to endure it are ultimately gifts from God. So we are given two gifts during those difficult times. God sees our yesterdays, are todays and forever. And he only has goodness and mercy in all that we experience. Charles Spurgeon said, quote, a sovereign God put me here. If there were better circumstances for me, God would have put me there. So yeah, it is easy to say that goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life when things are going well but we can see that our lives come under the authority of a diligent, a skillful, wise, and caring shepherd. And so even the painful experiences we go through are used to bring a lot of goodness and mercy into our lives. All things on a moment-by-moment -moment basis 
our goodness and mercy from the hand of God. You know, this should have an impact on how we embrace the year, how we look at each day. You know, when we wake up each morning, we can know that we will only receive goodness and mercy from our good shepherd. We can intentionally see everything that we have to go through as a gift that we don't deserve. Because if we actually got what we deserved, we would all be in hell right now. You know, a recent example of seeing goodness and mercy in all the events that go through a day is when I heard a sermon from Pastor Matt Chandler that taught that there are things in our life that rob our affections for Christ. Each of us are different, so it's going to be a different answer for each of us. But what is it that robs your affections for Christ? Can we identify the things in our life that we know is stealing our heart's affections for Christ? One of those things for me is trying to get things done by a certain time and knowing that that time is running out. You know, if I have time to get things done, or even if I'm rushing, you know, that's not an issue for me. But all kinds of tension arises when I feel the pressure that I've got a minute to do 12 things. You know, when, when time is just running out and, and I'm, I'm out of time and I've got so much more to do. <clears throat> you know, recently at work, I set goals for myself each day as to the amount of work that I want to achieve in that day. And I've seen God's hand do some unusual things that don't normally happen to add to those goals for the day. And I saw myself wanting to get it all done in the same amount of time. And this was going on for a couple of days. I'm like, this is so unusual that this stuff would happen. Why is this happening? <clears throat> and I would get frustrated and angry and upset, and, and I could feel my heart getting calloused. Well, one day I was racing against the clock, and it was the last thing I had to do. I had to put a large cart of boxes into a crusher. And it was just a minutes before I had to punch out. So I was moving as quickly as possible, and of course I tried to save a step by taking a larger amount in my hand. And of course it all slipped out of my hands and knocked the whole pile of boxes over. Everything was scattered all over the place. Needless to say, it was robbing my affections for Christ. At the same time, I was looking at this in frustration, and my heart was calloused, and I was upset. And I felt the Lord tell me, he says, you want this too much. You want it too much. You want to accomplish this more than you want me. You know, it's good to desire to accomplish things that's healthy. Don't get me wrong, it's good to desire to accomplish things. But I was clearly over-desiring accomplishment. The Lord used that fumble and circumstance to point out an idol that I've wrestled with for years. And you know, I still wrestle with that, but at least I can now identify something that robs my affections for Christ and to know what the root cause of it is. I've learned that over-desiring things that I want to get done quickly, really calluses my heart. <clears throat> so now I can watch my heart's desire when there's a time crunch on something. I could watch out for that. See, that mistake, that circumstance, was a real gift to me because that was robbing my affections for Christ. Lastly, seeing God's goodness and mercy in everything should challenge us. You know, as goodness and mercy follow us wherever we go, so should goodness and mercy be left behind as a legacy for others wherever we go. You know, the analogy that David uses is one of a sheep and a shepherd. If sheep are properly managed, they can be the most beneficial of all livestock. <clears throat> a commentator once wrote that in some ancient writings, Sheep were referred to as those of the golden hooves because of the positive impact that they have on the land. Author Philip Keller wrote that, quote, a sheep's manure is the best balance of any produced by domestic stock. 
when scattered effectively, it proves of enormous benefit to the soil. You know, in addition, the habit of sheep going up to the highlands to rest is a huge benefit for those lands too because they take the rich nutrients of the valley. And when they go to the highland, they redeposit things up there, making that land productive. And no other livestock will eat such a wide variety of plants. They'll eat all sorts of weeds and other undesirable plants that might even take over the field. They've been known to restore land that has been ravaged with overgrowth and dangerous weeds like no other animal can. Sheep can transform a property <clears throat> that was once a depressing eyesore into a beautiful manicured field. So sheep leave behind productivity where there was barrenness, beauty where there was ugliness, and order where there was chaos. So the challenge is, do I leave behind blessing wherever I've been? Do I leave the legacy of God's goodness and mercy wherever I go? Do I make much of Christ by leaving behind beauty, productivity, order, and blessing? You see, God's goodness and mercy in every event and seeing it there and aiming to leave it behind wherever you go will lead us to proclaim like David did in Psalm 65, 11, where he says, you crown the year with your goodness and your paths drip with abundance. So this should encourage us as we face the days of 2021, as we face each and every day, knowing we will only get goodness and mercy, and it should challenge us to leave that goodness and mercy behind. We don't know what will happen in the remainder of this year. Will things improve from 2020? And I know for a lot of us, we're off to a rough start. It's been a rough year so far for many of us. Will they get worse? Well, I want to encourage you, if there's anyone watching who has not yet put their lives under the authority of the great shepherd, do not harden your heart. He's calling you to come to him. Turn your life from sin and separation from God and run to commit your life to live under his authority, care, and leadership. He has the infinite ability, knowledge, skill, and love to care for those who belong to him. For those who do this, they'll walk in paths that drip with an abundance of goodness. And surely goodness and mercy will follow them all the days of their lives. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we just confess that we are, we're walking in a valley, a season of, of walking in a, in a very low valley. Lord, that's on a macro level with what we're going through in, in a pandemic, in our political climate. Father, we, as a nation, but, Father, that's also on a micro level. We're all going through things personally, Lord, that we're, we're looking to you in this valley. And, Father, especially in times like this, we want to thank you that we can boast that you are our shepherd. There is no other place to turn, and there's no greater place to turn. And so we want to thank you, God, for being our shepherd. And we know that if we have you, we have all that we need. We know that we're under your care, even though the pain hurts, and we confess that, and, and it's discouraging at times. But we want to thank you for your promises. We want to thank you for your nourishment. We want to thank you for the encouragement and the love and support that comes through so many avenues. It comes through your word, through prayer, through each other as a family in Christ. We thank you for surrounding us. Lord, in our dark hours, we're never, we're never alone, and we thank you for that. Thank you for being our great shepherd. We love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand to receive the Lord's blessing. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.